Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we're going to revisit a conversation that we had a few months ago. We had talked about passwordless authentication, but one of those methods of passwordless authentication that is really a win-win for most security organizations is Windows Hello for Business. And Windows Hello for Business is a way to authenticate to your Windows computer using either a PIN, a facial recognition, or a um, FIDO2 key, or a fingerprint. There's multiple different ways to do it, and it is passwordless. And why it is a win-win is because it not only makes it more secure, but it also is more convenient for users. I don't think I've ever implemented Windows Hello for Business in an organization where I get a lot of pushback from users because it's something that is really nice for them to have. It makes it easy for them to log into their computers. So one of the concerns that happens a lot with Windows Hello for Business, especially if you're using biometrics like a fingerprint or a facial recognition uh, algorithm in order to sign in is for a lot of companies who have really locked down environments, they're concerned about privacy. And if you're storing those fingerprints or the face for both privacy and of course security in the fact that maybe I could take a picture of myself and use it over the camera and be able to unlock the computer using a picture or having that fingerprint be stored in O365 or somewhere in the cloud. And then if the company gets breached, now all of a sudden my fingerprint is in the wild and available for attackers. What do you have to say about that, Adam? Well, first off, definitely respect and understand the concern. It's valid because anytime we're talking about a biometric, we're talking about a method you can't change. You can change your password. You can change your pin. You can't really change your face very easily unless you're Nicolas Cage and face off. But anyhow, it's something that's static. And so you, of course, want to be very protective of it. And it's worth noting, regardless of what we're talking about, if we're talking about iPhone, we're talking about Android, we're talking about Windows PCs, none of them store biometrics in a way where it could be reconstructed back into your face or your fingerprint. They store kind of a mathematical model that compares different landmarks of those biometrics, and they're usually unique to that specific hardware. In fact, you usually can't even take one and replay it on another device because there's some individual hardware characteristics that are baked into that biometric that are going to be unique to just that fingerprint reader or just that camera. But even putting all that aside, it's worth noting that the way this works, everything is local to the device. In fact, this is the inherent security benefit of Windows Hello for Business, is that it requires the combination of the biometric or the pin plus the device. It is not something that is stored on any remote server or any remote cloud. It's unique to that device only. So let's take a theoretical example. I have a Surface Book 3 that I used for work at Microsoft. And when I got that device, I was asked to enroll in Windows Hello for Business when I got it. And so first off, they validate my username and password. Then they ask me to do a multi-factor challenge of some kind, whether that's a text message, a phone call, um, an authenticator app on my phone, something to prove some step-up authentication before I'm able to create and enroll my Windows Hello for Business uh, setup. And so then it will actually have me look at the camera and it will create a depth map of my face. And again, that's stored locally just on that Surface Book 3. That's not 
accessible to Microsoft IT. It's not accessible to anything in the Microsoft cloud. And then it also asked me to create a pin. And actually the same benefit is there too. When I create that pin that is never transmitted over any network or stored anywhere else, it's just local to that device. So when we say that biometric never leaves the device, that is the security benefit of Windows Hello. Like the whole concept falls apart if that were untrue because that's where a password is fallible. I have a password that's stored on a remote server that knows what that password is, or at least knows knows what the hash of it is. And then I type in my password and transmit that over the network and that remote server compares it. So it's not just a secret that's unique to just that one device. That secret is on multiple devices. That secret transverses a network. There's all sorts of issues inherent with that model. So That's why you can feel really confident that when we talk about the security benefit of Windows Hello for Business, and we talk about things like your facial recognition data or your fingerprint recognition data is local to the device, you can trust that that is true because the entire security promise of the service breaks if that were to not be true. And so that all happens between the security chipset on your device, the TPM, and is used to unlock that TPM to perform security operations. So something to hopefully give you a little more confidence in when when we talk about these things, the risk of an attacker being able to potentially steal these biometric representations of your face or your fingerprint and being able to replay them later are, are, are really not there because that's not how it's configured. And even when those devices that are unique to that piece of hardware to read um, your face or to read your fingerprint are doing those, they're, they're done in such a way that there's very limited interaction between that interface and the actual software running on the PC by design. It, it happens more just internally to the device itself. And so there, there's a lot of protections there and, and a lot of um, guarantees in place to prevent the risk of replay of those kind of attacks. So you should be pretty confident in that and, and know that your privacy is, is inherent to the way the system is architected. It, it Again, and I, I know I've said this like three times, but I just want to really reiterate the point. If, if we are storing your facial recognition data on another server, then Windows Hello is not the security benefit we claim it is. So that's something to be aware of. That's, that's what makes it great is that it is local to the device only. And when it comes to like pin versus password, like you said, Adam, because the pin is local to the device, if I knew your pin, mm-hmm. it does me no good unless I actually have your Surface Book 2 or Surface Book 3 as well. If I knew your password, and let's say f- for argument's sake you didn't have MFA enabled, well then I have access to all the things that your username and password have access to. So I don't need your device. So that's why, again, the pin versus password or... Um, Windows hello versus password is always a better option. Even if you just implement it with a six digit pin, because again, that pin is local to the device and I would have to have that device. Whereas your password is transmitted over the wire, over the network. And, and on that note, there are plenty of organizations that do roll out windows. Hello with just a pin. And that's great. I always emphasize to my customers, I say constantly, you do not need biometrics to deploy Windows Hello for business. You can do it with just a pin. Now, something I will ask very strongly of you, that unless you have a regulatory need that states otherwise, do not treat the pin like a password. It is not a password. It is not stored anywhere else. It's not a shared secret. You do not need to have it expire. You do not need tons of complexity. You do not need tons of length. You know, I, I always love that old XKCD comic where they talk about, you know, in one panel, it's the attackers saying, oh, we're going to decrypt his hard drive. Blast! It's encrypted with 4,096-bit 4, RSA. We're doomed. And then in the second panel, it's what would really happen. And it's hit him with this $5 wrench until he tells us the password, right? So, yes, there are anti-hammering protections in place at a silicon level inside TPM where it will prevent so many attempts from being made on the pin. But even, even if you ignore that again, you know, 
it, it's one of those things of that that whole usability versus security trade off anyway. It's not the same as a password, so don't just take your password policy and apply it to your PIN because the the threat vectors, the risk surface, the probability of risk are totally different things. So do an independent risk analysis for PIN and set your policy appropriately. I will tell you very openly, Microsoft's policy is six digit numeric PIN that never expires. So I have had one PIN the whole time I've been at Microsoft. I set it once on my first day and I used it on my first device I got. And then I re-implemented it on the second device I got. And I've never been asked to change it, never been asked to add more complexity. And Microsoft is not the answer to everyone, you know, and, and I would never claim that you should do everything we do exactly how we do it. But as a reference point, that is valuable to know that a organization that takes security very, very seriously and is entrusted with a lot of customer data uses a model like that and, and feels that is sufficient to meet the security needs of the organization. So take that for what it's worth. That is such a great call out, Adam, because it is the same concept when you try to implement PIN on MDM devices, just a quick tangent as well, because it, it's a little bit relevant. Those PINs are unique to the device. Like you said, you got a second device, you implemented the same PIN, but technically you didn't have to. You could have had two different PINs for two mm -hmm. different devices. Mm -hmm. And again, they're unique to the device. For MDM, I have been in an organization where we tried MDM and had expiration on pins for iOS and Android devices. And that was a complete nightmare because most people, they plug in their phone, they never turn it off. They, they use their biometrics nowadays. And then when all of a sudden it does an update or does something and reboots, they don't remember the pin because we've forced them to change it. And the way that iOS generally works is you enter it in a bunch of times, it'll lock itself, and then maybe it'll even erase. And and those pins are unique to the device, so it's not like Apple can break into them. So it's based on the last iCloud backup and all this other stuff, and all of a sudden people lose the wedding photos that they had stored on their phone or whatever it is. So definitely, like Adam said, independent risk analysis for pin expiration versus password expiration, unless you have some sort of regulatory um, compliance that you have to to do so definitely a good call out so one of the other things that i want to point out is windows hello and windows hello for business are not the same thing so on home pcs and pro pcs that implement what we call a convenience pin or a convenience sign-in is not the same thing as Windows Hello for Business. Windows Hello for Business actually uses the asymmetric encryption to sign and, and do the whole key exchange with your O365 Azure account versus where the Windows Hello Home Edition, so to speak, doesn't do that cryptographic, cryptographically backed <laughs> encryption to essentially unlock your device or unlock your account. So it is a convenience sign-in only versus a security feature. Think of it like if you have a password vault on your iPhone and you normally can unlock it with just your face ID and then it will autofill that password in, in a field. That's what Windows Hello is, is kind of like behind the scenes. You're using either a biometric or a simple pin to do like fill in your password in a form kind of auth. That's, that's Windows Hello versus Windows Hello for Business is like Andy said or, or tried to say, it's that it's based on public private key cryptography which is totally different and, and there are no passwords involved. So despite the similarities in name and, and LOL, Microsoft marketing department, LOL, um, they're very different things. So <laughs> that's a good call out. We never claim that Microsoft has the best naming conventions <laughs> here on this show. <laughs> no. So when it comes to deployment of Windows Hello for Business, there are a bunch of deployment models that are listed in the docs and 
obviously it can get a little bit confusing. So we'll try to break it down for you. For folks who are on-prem and completely on-prem only, and that means that you have no O365, you're using Office, the perpetual licensing, like Office 2013, 2016, 2019, you are using Exchange on-prem, you are solely on-prem with AD and not syncing to Azure AD. So, there And there are some businesses out there who are still doing that. Maybe it's because of regulatory requirements and regula- regulations kind of are slow to update to the cloud. If you're like that, you can still do an on-prem deployment of Windows Hello for Business. And that requires some Windows Hello for Business servers. There are two different models for the on-prem and it's very similar to the hybrid model which we'll get into but for the on-prem ones again you have to have windows hello for business servers you have to have an on-prem infrastructure only and then there are two different deployment models for that one is called key trust and one is called certificate trust with key trust you're using the domain controllers to escrow the key that will be used to authenticate your users using Windows Hello for Business. With Certificate Trust, you're using certificates that you issue out through your internal PKI to authenticate to Windows Hello for Business. Now, the main difference is if you are using Key Trust, which uses the domain controllers, you need to have a certain number of 2016 domain controllers. And that's different than your domain level So not to be confused with the level of your domain, which a lot of people have had conversations with customers where they're like, oh, we're only 2012. Like that's different. It's the actual OS of your domain controllers. You have to have 2016 domain controllers, which has the feature to escrow the key. There is a formula to calculate how many domain controllers are required. And it's based on how many authentications are happening that the domain controller has to perform these authentications. So if it's a smaller organization, you may only need one 2016 domain controller. If it's a larger one and you have hundreds, thousands of users authenticating, you're going to need multiple 2016 domain controllers. And again, there's a spreadsheet within the documents, which I'll link in the show notes to kind of help you through sizing for your deployment. For hybrid models very similar again there's the same two deployment models key trust and certificate trust we didn't talk too much about certificate trust certificate trust both for on-prem and hybrid don't require that 2016 domain controller but it does require you to have an internal pki and issue out those certificates And then you have to maintain those certificates. If you revoke or expire user certificates within two, three years, then you'll need to reissue those certificates to those users. It does require at least 2012 domain controllers. So that for sure. I mean, if you're on 20 or 2008 domain controllers, you should probably upgrade to 2012 anyways. So it's pretty current and in both models in both certificate and key trust they again use that asymmetric key pairs they both use the tpm hardware and so that's very similar it's just do you want to escrow the key with the domain controller or do you want to issue out certificates to perform that asymmetric key exchange andy can you walk our listeners through a decision tree on which model to use. So obviously hybrid versus on-prem, that's going to be informed by, do you have Azure AD sync configured is essentially kind of the decision point there. So that's kind of decision point one. If you have no Azure AD sync stood up, you're not doing it, you don't do anything in Azure AD, then you're on-prem. Otherwise you're hybrid. Okay, next step. You are looking at key trust versus certificate trust. What's kind of the decision points there and which direction you should go? The biggest decision is whether or not you have an internal PKI system and you want to maintain those user certificates for 
specifically Windows Hello for Business Authentication. That's so if half. you right. So <laughs> if you if you if you don't have internal PKI, then you may not want to go with a certificate trust because let's be honest, PKI is complicated. Mm-hmm. And to be able to have an internal PKI and to be able to issue out those certificates to users and maintain those, you need someone who is proficient at doing that. Even if you do have an internal PKI, again, issuing out user certificates versus machine certificates through Active Directory is a totally different thing. Mm-hmm. So you need expertise in order to do that and to scope it correctly. And the other decision tree is do you have enough 2016 domain controllers in order to perform enough authentications mm-hmm. if you were to go with the key trust deployment? Mm-hmm. So it's it's a tough way either way. I talked to a customer earlier last week about the same thing. They didn't have all 2016 domain controllers. They had one, I think, out of a large number of domain controllers. And then they did have an internal PKI. Internal PKI in certificate trust is more complicated, but again, they had expertise. So they said, this is probably the way that we're going to go. Key trust is a lot easier to deploy. Certificate trust is a lot more difficult, a little bit more complicated. So again, another decision making. So I I think I, I kind of pulled out three of them there where one of them is, do I have PKI already stood up and in place? And I think the second part of your point is even bigger. The appetite, the expertise, and the buy-in to do all the care and feeding that comes with it. There's the number of domain controllers you have that are running 2016, and that kind of is going to factor into it as well. Is there any security difference in in the security of the solution comparing key versus certificate trust and or are there any feature differences things that i can only do with one model or the other no there's no difference in the security both are going to be just as secure and feature wise again no different so the the only difference is how those key exchanges are being dealt with in the back end but for the user and for IT implementing it later on, it's going to be the exact same. So there are some differences, again, with hybrid and on-prem. So like with hybrid, there are some requirements to Azure AD Sync, to do password hash sync in the background, as well as enroll those certificates to the machines through GPO or some sort of automated enrollment for the domain controller. And then for Certificate trust, you have to issue out those user certs. Again, also deploy them out to the machines. Same way through probably GPO. But it's more semantics than than the actual authentication or security. So you're going to get the same security benefits. Users are going to see the same benefits in passwordless sign-in. So there is one nuance difference to be aware of in case this is an exact use case you're looking to achieve. If you're wanting to do remote desktop connection and using your windows low credentials to sign into a remote desktop, like a server, you actually do need certificate trust for that one thing. And that's the only thing I can think of where there is a functional difference between the two. So that is the one I do know where there is a difference. And I think Andy, you took it in the other direction of you were thinking like in terms of user experience, is there a difference? And no, you know, from the way I sign in is exactly the same. In fact, users don't ever have to know how you've configured it, but there is that one point where you can only do that, that remote desktop sign in to like servers, for example, with the certificate trust currently. And I know that's being worked on. There's an item on the docs page that says it's still being looked at, but that's a current limitation of key trust. And the only one that I know of. That is a pretty cool feature. And I don't have that one stood up in my lab, so I can't experience (laughs) it myself because I went in my lab with a key trust deployment model for my quote unquote hybrid deployment. And it was very easy to stand up. I didn't have to deal with PKI. So that's not something that I get to test in my environment, but I've seen it in practice and it is pretty neat to be able to use windows hello for business to RDP into a server. Mm -hmm. So that's a good call out. Thanks, Adam. Mm -hmm. 
The other method is obviously cloud. That's kind of the fifth method of deploying Windows Hello for Business. And that, of course, is probably the easiest method to use is to use Intune and we call it key trust in the cloud because you're using Azure AD to escrow the key. That requires no on-prem infrastructure. It does require to authenticate using Azure AD and then management in the cloud. So Azure AD joined devices using Intune to manage them. And it is a simple policy within Intune, a configuration profile that enables and configures the Windows Hello for Business sign-in. So pretty easy to do. As Adam mentioned, you can do it on enrollment with the computer when the computer boots up and they first get it for the first time if you're using autopilot. Mm -hmm. And it can be enrolled right there, first time the user signs in using MFA. So that is probably the easiest way to do it, in my opinion. Absolutely. And so, listener, if you are saying... I want to do a pilot or a POC of this to show it to management to get them to buy in so we can deploy this and all the things. And you're looking at that daunting list list of tasks to enable this in your production environment. If you want to stand up a quick pilot, you can, I mean, I am not an expert windows administrator by any means. And it is trivial to stand up Windows Hello for Business in the cloud. It requires nothing. You just pretty much deploy a policy to a Azure AD join device that says, hey, do Windows Hello for Business. <laughs> like that's all you have to do. And the device will just do it. There's there's zero configuration. So that's something if you have a device, you can reset it back to the out-of-box experience in Windows. You can stand up Azure AD join in your demo tenant or your test tenant or your sandbox tenant. And you can join that, do Windows Hello, and say, hey, boss, look, Windows Hello, this is cool. We should do this. And you can have that stood up in no time. So if you're looking at a way that does not require a ton of expertise in Windows management to be able to quickly show it in real-world scenarios on your hardware in your organization, that is your ticket to do that. So even... We understand most organizations are not fully cloud, although, hey, go listen to our Shannon Fritz episode because we'd love to see you adopt more Azure AD, Azure AD Join, but certainly has a ton of benefit here as a way to quickly spin something up and show it to the decision makers of your org. Speaking of the Shannon Fritz episode, a really good one that talks about device identity, there is a key differentiator when it comes to the authentication chain for hybrid versus Azure AD in this case. So if you're on-prem or you're hybrid, in both of those cases, you do need line of sight to your domain controller. Shannon had talked about when you sign in using Windows Hello for Business on a hybrid Azure AD joint device that you are essentially authenticating to the domain controller. And if you have a cloud join device that the authentication is the same, if you were to try to access an on-prem resource, you still need to authenticate and it hits AD. But if you authenticate using Windows Hello for Business because you haven't typed in your password, it authentic it has to ask you for that user credential the first time you do that. So in the cloud, it's the same thing as versus the hybrid Azure AD or on-prem device, when you're using Windows Hello for Business, it has to have line of sight to the DC versus with Azure Active Directory joint devices for Windows Hello for Business, it does not need a line of sight to the DC. And that's an important differentiator. So if you're trying to stand up Windows Hello for Business and you're not doing it in the cloud like we talked about, think of it like an on-prem device. It needs to have some sort of VPN or be on the network when you authenticate using Windows Hello for Business. Now, I had the question come up, well, what if, what if the user is remote and I'm using Windows Hello for Business? There's always the backup, right, to go to the password. If you've typed in the password at some point, you know that Windows caches those credentials. As long as that machine still has domain trust and it hasn't been off the network for so long that it loses domain trust, you're going to be able to authenticate using the password as a backup. But if you're using Windows Hello for Business, it does need to 
exchange that Kerberos ticket, really, when it comes down to it. If you look at the authentication chain for hybrid Azure AD, the Kerberos provider has to locate the DC before it even sends the communication back and forth when you're authenticating using the Windows Hello for Business. And it sends a Kerberos request to the DC. The DC validates a certificate or key and it returns that TGT, the ticket granting ticket. And the machine validates the cert, passes it back to the LSAS, and then you get a successful login. And so again, that whole authentication chain for hybrid requires line of sight to the domain controller. Very, very important. And the reason why this is such an important call out is with the ongoing shift in work. And, you know, I'm going to avoid like getting into the hybrid work discussion, but we'll just acknowledge it here with that ongoing shift and being more agile with where and how people work. Companies continuously are looking for ways to reduce that dependency on line of sight to domain controllers. And the answer to that is not Windows Hello for Business. It is going to have the same limitations and restrictions and, and caveats as using a password when you're in hybrid mode. You still need that occasional line of sight to the domain controller before you get cached credentials. And then you can ride out the storm on cached credentials for a while, but eventually you need line of sight again. That story still holds true here if you're in hybrid. Hybrid does not reduce that relationship between Windows and that on-premises domain controller. You're just changing how the authentication happens, but not where it happens. So that's a really fundamental point to understand here is that this is not your ticket to solve that dependency. Now, again, not trying to get off topic here, but if you continue to have interest in eliminating that dependency, and you should, then you need to look at Azure AD Join because that is the solution to eliminating the dependency and moving that dependency to a cloud-facing, internet-facing service. That's how you get out of this. But otherwise, you're going to continue to have a lot of the same scenarios bubble up that you've dealt with in the past. It's just the way the user authenticates is different. Now, it still supports all the same, like Andy mentioned, all the same cached credentials and all the stories that come with that. But eventually, you're going to need line of sight. So have an awareness there. This doesn't solve that need. But I would not discourage you from doing this if you're still hybrid because of that. As, as Andy and I always mention, incremental improvement is still improvement. And especially for passwordless, when we talk about this dream of someday, we're not even going to have hashes in Active Directory. We're not even going to have password hashes in Azure AD because we're not going to use them. We don't, we don't even want them in there because that is now just attack surface. That's the dream. Now, as long as we continue to have scenarios where we say, oh, well, you can fall back to password, then that dream's not realized. And so that's also where people will sometimes come in with passwordless methods and say, well, what good is it if a password's still available? We cannot get rid of passwords until we have credible alternatives in place, deployed and fully vetted, fully in production. Getting rid of passwords is never going to be an option until we're there. And so by you rolling out methodologies like Windows Low for Business, which are tried and true and tested in the enterprise, you're going to find those rough edges. You're going to find those scenarios that your organization uniquely needs to address. And that's exactly why you do this, to find them, to start solving them, so that when the day comes, when it becomes a valid option to say, hey, Andy, you want to go delete all the password hashes from Active Directory? And people are like, heck yeah, we do. You can't get there until you have a completely rock solid production passwordless environment in place. So again, sometimes security, we get in our own heads on if this doesn't solve all of my needs, why would I do it? And in this particular scenario, we have to get password this figured out before we can actually remove that attack surface of passwords. And so something to think about here, you can't do one before the other. Can't put the cart before the horse. For listeners and folks who have shared machines in their environment, this is kind of a specific use case that I like to point out with Windows Hello for Business. If you have a shared machine, there is a limitation in the hardware, the TPM chip, that can only store up to 10 secrets. And so 
every machine, if I'm a person on the shop floor, every machine that I sign into, if you have Windows Hello for Business implemented, I would have to set up Windows Hello for Business on every machine that I sign into just once, just the first time, and it would have my pin and I can have the same pin on all the different 10 machines and, and I can have the same face and, and set that all up. However, I can only have 10 people set up windows. Hello for business on each individual machine. And that's a limitation of the hardware of the TPM chip. So what do you do in that case? FIDO2 is the answer. So instead of storing your secret on the TPM chip, you're going to store it on a, FIDO2 certified key, whether that be a USB, whether that be a badge that grants logical and physical access. That's a great use case, HID or some other partner that we have. They issue out NFC badges that you can use to card into the building as well as card into for Windows Hello for Business. And so those are the cases that you want to seriously consider FIDO2 because if you have 25, 50 people on a shop floor and they're accessing the same machine. Passwordless is great, but you can only do 10 people per machine if you're doing it with the TPM. So FIDO2 is the answer to that. Great call out there on the multi-user scenario. So Windows Hello for Business is generally not a multi-user solution. And FIDO2 really is the answer because I, Andy, I think you nailed it in such a simple way. We are essentially moving the storage of secrets we're offloading it from being inside the PC to being a separate piece of hardware, whether that's a USB device or I think the badge thing, give it a couple more years. It's just going to blow up because the beauty of having my single badge that gets me in the building has an NFC component built in. I tap it on a reader. I put in a pin and then I'm granted access to the PC. That's beautiful. And it's going to be so much better in so many different ways. And so that is supported, by the way. And it's considered kind of a Windows Hello for Business thing. It's under that umbrella. That's supported in both cloud joined as well as hybrid joined scenarios. So don't think you can't get access to that because originally it was cloud only. It's been available in hybrid joined scenarios now for quite some time as well. So regardless of how you want to do it, that is an option. And honestly, just look into the badge thing because I think there's opportunities for cost sharing because generally like InfoSec doesn't pay for badges. That's more of a physical security thing. That's some other department, usually like real estate and facilities or whomever. See if you can do some cost sharing on, hey, let's reissue badges. Let's get a whole new batch of HID badges in or whomever your vendor of choice is. And let's get the new ones with the NFC built in. And we can share the cost on that. And now it's not IT having to have that cost burden alone and you're going to have the most futuristic future proofed multi-user passwordless scenario ready to go. So for anybody who has those multi-user device scenarios, I, I, I think that's, that's just a great solution. And I get the challenges with a USB device, but I, I get really excited talking about that NFC stuff because I just really think that seems like at least in my head, is I think through the logistical challenges and everything else, I think that checks all the boxes. It really, really does. So um, I'd be curious, by the way, listeners, if anybody's doing anything like that today and not, not the old badge stuff like I see happen at the doctor's office where they have single factor authentication with just the badge, which terrifies me. No, no, no. I want tap the badge, put in a pin, sign in, you know, full passwordless credential. If you're doing that, especially with FIDO2 and NFC, shoot us a, a note because I'd love to hear more about it. So hopefully we've given you some information today that you may not have known and empowered you to take this and maybe start a pilot of it and try to convince your leadership or deploy it in your environment. And really, like Adam said, you know, it's not hard to get started. You could deploy it in the cloud very easily as a POC, as a demo. You can buy a couple of very cheap FIDO2 keys to test those out too. There's a few that on the cheaper end for only like 12 to 15 bucks a piece. And so, yeah, take this information, test it out. Even if you're doing a small pilot for hybrid, you can do that pretty easily in a key trust environment for a few devices. You don't even need to worry about scale if you're only 
authenticating a couple of devices. You can scope it to a single OU using a GPO and just get started and start testing it. And I guarantee you the people that you enroll <laughs> in these test devices or these test policies, they will love you for it. I've never had anyone say, hey, that whole pin sign in, the facial sign in thing, I don't like it. I'm Every time I've rolled it out, in fact, it broke for a little bit at my previous company where I rolled it out and the people who got new devices, they were like, hey, uh, I'd like to get back into that testing that you were doing. And, you know, I had to spend some time to fix it and get it back up and running. And, you know, they really appreciate that convenience of signing in. Talk about if you need a little reputation boost or you need to smooth things over with some of your users, this is a great win for InfoSec. I mean, A, it's better for information security as we've gone throughout here, but the user experience, we didn't even mention, and maybe we should have, this counts from a NIST perspective as meeting all of the criteria for being a multi-factor authentication. And so running with that, if you have conditional access policies that say you must do MFA to get access to email or to do this thing for all your users who are on Windows Low for business enabled devices, they're going to zoom right past that prompt. They're never even going to see it. They're going to get a seamless single sign on right to the resource they're trying to access because they already did multi factor authentication when they signed into their PC. And so that is an absolute thing of beauty where the user experience is off the charts phenomenal. And by the way, as we always call out when we talk about passwordless, phishing benefits too. When users never have to put in their password, A, they start to forget them, which genuinely happens at Microsoft. People will forget their passwords. But B, if something pops up and it's like, hey, I'm Microsoft, give me your password. I'm like, uh, no, no. MSIT would never ask for my password because we don't use passwords anymore kind of thing. So tons and tons of benefits here. Security wins, user wins. Uh, if Again, if you want to earn some love, man, there's no better way to go. And Andy laid out all the ways to easily and quickly try this out, roll it out with the limited audience and get going. So curious to hear your Windows Low for Business wins, or uh, if you have any questions we can answer, you know, happy to take those as well. But uh, something I think you can tell, I hope it came through on the show this week, something we're really passionate about because it is such a phenomenal user experience and it's such a phenomenal security win. And he started the top of the show saying it's a win-win and it truly is. So get going, get started with it and uh, let us know how it goes. That's our show for this week. Thanks for listening. As always, our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have any questions or want to, us to talk about any security topics that you have in mind. Thanks. And we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the blue security podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed and subscribe. So you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at a jaw zero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.